Creepy Pasta Narration Part 22 I think I want to do this and two more at least. I know I should go to bed, but I feel that I want to do a few more stories. Though... It's getting a little hard to see, actually, to read. So please forgive me if I stutter a few words. My vision's actually staring a bit fuzzy. A lot of the words are becoming doubled. So... I think my body's saying I absolutely have to go to sleep. Just everything's a bit blurry right now. So... I feel like I need to do a few more stories. Just a few more. This is, I think, part 22. And this story is, there's a reason you don't revisit your favorite childhood video games, and it's not the graphics. When my mom passed away, I was the sole one responsible for cleaning up her house. I don't have any siblings, and I didn't know my dad. As far as I knew, he was dead, so it fell on me to handle her affairs. I'm not the most organized person, so I have to say it was a pretty intimidating task. I started with the usual stuff, getting her affairs in order, taking care of the funeral arrangements, everything you have to do up until the body is buried. After that, it's just a matter of going through all her stuff, piece by piece. To say my mom was something of a hoarder would be an understatement. Okay, so she was hardly reality TV worthy. But she hung on to a lot of junk. It's overwhelming. Going through everything. But I won't lie. It felt nice. Each little trinket was a memory. Even the tattered dolly she saved brought back warm feelings in my childhood. Halloweens, when she would lay it out on the end table where we kept the candy bucket. I spent a few days going through all of it. She had a shed in her backyard, a sizable thing where she kept most of her knickknacks. It was cold in that shed, holes in the side of it letting in freezing wind. I wore my thick jacket and worked into the night. Just me and my twin sounds of wind and shuffling boxes. Before long, I let my mind wander to the loneliness of my task. In decreasing the light outside, I hadn't even realized it was getting so dark. I kind of freaked myself out thinking about the wind whistling through the holes in the walls. I was more drained than I realized. There were plenty of boxes still to sort through, but only one left on the ground. Determined to finish this one and then enjoy my night, I lifted up the lid and was pleasantly surprised. Inside was my own Nintendo and a stack of games. I am going to get through these stories with the power of Mountain Dew. And thankfully, this Mountain Dew is not flat. Now, I'm hardly a gamer. I have a current console, and I use it for the one series of my friends I play regularly, but that's about it. As a kid, we didn't have a lot of money. But I remember my mom splurging one Christmas and getting it for me. I only ever owned a few games, but I played the hell out of them. I remember my days bunny hopping in the adventure of Link. It was really confused why they changed the gameplay for Legend of Zelda. My friend had to tell me the adventure of Link actually came second, which blew my mind. Link was the main character. Why wouldn't they title the first game after him? I had five, and I remember them all too well. The warm feeling of sitting in front of our TV coming back to me. I pulled them out of the box and slid them out of their sleeves. The satisfying sound of the plastic scraping against plastic, bringing a smile to my face. 
Final Fantasy where I spent hours trying to perfect the right party. Adventure Island, where I always replay just to use the skateboard. Ninja Turtles, which I beat as every character. There were five that I remembered so vividly, so I was surprised when I pulled out a sixth game. The cartridge was black instead of the usual gray, which seems like it should have sparked my memory right then and there, but it didn't. It didn't help that the title on top of the cover had been worn away, leaving me with just the art. As I stared at the image of a sinister figure, clutching a tombstone as he rose from an open grave, it came back to me. I used to play this game every day. I had enjoyed it because it was kind of dark. It felt like a forbidden thing that I shouldn't have been allowed to play. The whole thing took place at night, and I remembered having to explore a dark castle to kill a demon. Are we talking about Simon's Quest? Is this Castlevania 2? Is that the game he's talking about? Thinking about it, I couldn't recall exactly what made it so dark, because it wasn't like Final Fantasy didn't have skeletons and monsters. That really annoyed me. It's like trying to remember someone's name that you see every day. It's stuck in the back of your head for something so far hard to read blurry words. <sighs> I played all the time. It was unacceptable that I couldn't remember more than first entering that imposing castle, let alone the title of it. Yeah. Right then I decided I need to try it out again. I wanted to relive those glory days, find out what I'd forgotten in my head. That castle was an imposing sight, fully realized in beautiful graphics. Part of me just wanted to see how much of my memory was tainted by rose-colored glasses. There, there were two old CRT TVs in the shed, but only the small black one worked. I set it down on a bar stool, plugged it into an extension cord, and ran that along the floor to the only power outlet in the shed. I got the Nintendo hooked up to. I attached the AV cables to the TV, the controller to the console. Everything powered on just fine. I stared at the fuzzy penguins on the TV. A little joke my mom and I had. The static looked like a bunch of jumbled up fuzzy penguins. I pressed the channel button over until it switched to three and was met with a black screen. I was feeling kind of excited as I pulled the cartridge from its sleeve. It reminded me of Christmas morning, getting a new game each year, my mom always so happy watching me unwrap it. She always knew just what I wanted because she'd bring home old issues of Nintendo Power from the house she cleaned. And I'd tell her stories about all the cool games I saw. Of course, I was always behind the times of the corner games, but I didn't care because I loved what I had, no matter if everyone else had already played them. The lid popped up with a satisfying click and the spring squeaked ever so slightly. The mystery cartridge slid in place, plastic scraping the sides of the machine. Chip set, checking, clicking in. I pressed down, pushing the game into position, and hit the reset button. Nothing happened. I was still staring at a black screen. Panic rushed through me. Not a real or earned panic, but panic all the same. The thought that I might not get to play this game, have to go forever without being able to remember the title filled me with existential dread. It's hard to let stuff like that go without it nagging at you forever, or at least for an extremely annoying day. I breathed and told myself it would work. Then pulling out the cartridge, doing the same thing every kid with Nintendo was all too familiar with, I blew into it. It looks like you're trying to play like a harmonica, but it gets the job done. Lo and behold, I popped in, pressed the reset button, and the screen flashed as the game booted to the title screen. But it was just the image of the imposing castle. How could the game not include its title on the title screen? It didn't make any sense. There was only one option on the main screen. Press start. So I pressed it and was met with an ominous beep. Music began. A bass-filled chip tune like an or op operatic orchestra. I'd never heard anything like it. Didn't even think it was possible to make something that wasn't that wasn't high pitched 
on an 8-bit system. The screen faded out, the pixelated wash of colors. There were no text boxes explaining my quest. I was just dumped right into the forest. My character looked like an average person, just wearing plain pants and a shirt. He looked nothing like the typical fantasy heroes. Knights in armors and Belmonts carry whips. I hit the right arrow and my character started walking. While I checked out my buttons to A jumped and B did nothing. My character didn't seem to have it didn't seem to have attack. I didn't remember jumping on enemies to kill them, but then again, I don't remember how much of the game at all. There was a white square at the top of the screen that sat empty. For an NES game, the forest was creepy as hell. It started with a low layer of fog across the ground. An impressive effect for the time it was made. Bats flapped toward my character and he ducked underneath them. The further he got, the worse the forest became. Skulls hung from the trees. Candles in their eye sockets. Burning away. Headless skeletons burst out of the ground. I hit jump and my character landed on a skeleton, managing only to hurt himself. That obviously wasn't how I killed things. He hopped over the rest and continued along the path. I was expecting a boss, but the character reached the end of the screen and went back, and the music stopped. Pretty anticlimactic. But I was in for a treat. This was what I remembered. The music came back, low and moaning, like Gregorian chanting. As my character approached the massive castle featured on the title screen, the drawbridge lowered as my character approached. I felt uneasy stepping across the wooden bridge. The music stopped, unsettling me as much all I could hear as the wind creaking through the holes in the shed and the trees overhead, whipping the roof. The screen changed as the character stepped past the gate, and then he was inside the castle, greeted by a terrifying digital screech of pain. The noise almost made me stop playing. The high pitch at once grating and frightening at the same. It felt real, like the developers had digitized an actual recorded scream. But more than that, I could feel the pain behind it. I depressed the right arrow button and continued charging on. The castle was nicely lit, almost welcoming if it had been not been for the scream. There were no enemies at all. The level continued scrolling until I hit a staircase, and the game took control and sent my character down the steps. The screen transitioned out into a courtyard full of tombstones. It was a veritable graveyard with a spooky tree that reminded me of the Spindleyland oak in my mom's backyard. A set of tombstones ripped themselves up from the earth and stacked together into a walking sepulcher. The music roared with a tune fitting for a boss. The walking tombstone monster spewed bones out at my character, which had a startlingly hard pattern to avoid. I could already tell this was one of those games they didn't go easy on the player. I hope maybe it was just one of those obnoxiously difficult first bosses, because I didn't really feel like spending all night in the shed. It didn't take me long to get in the swing of things, in fact. It felt like music, muscle memory and action, as I deftly dodged all the bones without taking a single hit to my character. And when the first barrage was finished, I noticed a flashing bone left. Behind on the ground, and walked my player over to it. And voila, I had my first weapon. A bone icon neatly filling the white box at the top of the screen. I pressed B and launched a bone in a downward arc. I smacked the tombstone boss and its body flashed bright white for a moment, satisfyingly making a successful hit. Each salvo gave me a single bone to hurl. And at the bottom, I missed once when the thing started flashing and changed its attack pattern, adding a jump into its repertoire. But otherwise, it was a perfect run, and the boss finally crumbled before my character. A grave was left unearthed in the ground. Certainly they wanted me to go inside, but my instincts told me to stay put because who would want to hop into an open grave? But the game didn't give me a choice because it took control of my character again, and he walked over, jumping right in the hole. The screen turned back and level 2 appeared on the screen. My character dropped down to a dark cave. Right away I noticed that something was very off. I was in a dungeon, not at all different from the ones I had seen before. But the decorations were very advanced and far more detailed than what I thought possible. Chains lined the wall, torture instruments too. I had to jump onto a pillory and use it as a platform to reach a higher floor. I couldn't shake how dark this felt for an NES game. Robed men carrying whips charged at my character. I had to duck beneath their attacks and then jump over their heads to continue. My character barged through the door. And I continued on as normal. 
The candles lighting the dungeon walls grew dimmer with each passing step. There were dark splotches of purple on the walls that I could barely make out, which I took to be an artistic choice to add depth to the otherwise blue tones of the dungeon. Then everything faded to black except my character. I waited, jumping in place like I usually did whenever I waited for a game to continue. The boss appeared faintly at first, blinking into existence. Then he flashed onto the screen, fully visible and horrific. Despite the pixel art, I could still tell that this giant man was supposed to be an executioner. He was covered in blood stains and wore a black hood. A tremendous axe was in his hands, dripping with little red pixels. The background came back on screen, and my eyes went wide. Even by today's video game standards, this wasn't tame. There were severed heads, viscera everywhere, gutted bodies, hanging up on chains. One person was still alive, his legs missing, his torso disemboweled, and yet I saw his sprite screaming and clawing toward the screen, as if begging for me to help him. The executioner laughed. I was in a bit of a daze and took some of the hits from the boss. But I got this pattern down quickly. I had to run forward whenever he jumped and slammed his axe down to get underneath the weapon. Just like the tombstone boss, each impact of the axe would create a flashing stone pickup on the screen that I could throw at the executioner. It only took six sets to kill him, and when the whirlwind attack he had when he was close to death was dodged simply by ducking. My character walked off screen. The text flashed again on the back background telling me I was on level three. It looked like I was still in the dungeon, but things had gone from bad to worse. I realize now that those purple blotches I had thought were shadowed bricks were actually bloodstains. The torture devices were filled with squirming people, their digitized voices begging for release. The enemies looked more of the same tortures, but dressed in leather armor instead of robes. However, I soon realized that their outfits were scandalously made of straps, and they appeared to have their genitals exposed as well as they could be for 8-bit graphics. Whenever... I would also like to say it's a good thing I'm sitting in a chair, otherwise if I was standing I would be collapsed right now. Like I... You know that feeling of vertigo? Hell, you ever have that feeling you go to a theme park and you ride a roller coaster, and then like, later that night you're like sitting down, and occasionally your body will start feeling those feelings? Like... You're on the roller coaster. Another way to describe it is, you ever have that thing where, like, you have those dreams where you're asleep and you all of a sudden feel yourself falling? Now imagine that, but you're fully awake sitting in a chair. And again, blurry words are fucking hard to read. But I'm not done reading yet. I want to read more. I don't I don't feel I've read enough. Whenever one of the enemies approached me, if there was a torture victim between him and my character, he would whip the victim. Chunks of flesh would break off in showers of blood, and little pixels representing their skin land on the ground. Exposed bone would left behind their flint skin. I accidentally hit B when I went to jump, taking a hit from the guard as he ran into me. Then I realized Weapon Square was filled by a bone icon. The torture victim my character had been standing on front had a hole in their leg where their femur used to be. I almost felt disgusted when I realized I had been the one to rip it out. I kept going, throwing the bone at one point, just wanting to get it out of my character's hands. I needed to finish the level. I needed to see how far this game went. I couldn't imagine it getting much worse, and yet I was starting to remember bits and pieces here and there. The dungeon seemed familiar, and even though I remembered the torture victims... My young mind hadn't processed what was really going on, or how terrible it was. What I found most alarming was that my, the thought that my mom would have allowed me to play such a game. It took me longer than it should have to make it out of the dungeon. I was distracted by the sprites actively being tortured in the background art, being stretched out on wheels or burned alive or shoved into Iron Maidens. But I got through it all and reached the end of level 3. Grateful that there wasn't a boss waiting for me. What was there was so much worse. Level 4 started with a pair of sprites. Two flesh-toned colors I took to be humans, but one was massive. The giant one... That's make me think of Dark Souls. What is it? Smog and... 
you know, there's the, the the big guy and the skinny guy that are like a tag team boss. There's like they redid it, and I think it was also a thing in Dark Souls One, and even in Code Vein. Like, what's the name of like the Buccaneer and the the guy? Like I'm, I know I'm sitting in one place, but every now and then I feel like I'm five feet to the left and then five feet to the right. And I know I'm not physically moving. And like this, this feeling, you can't describe it as dizziness. That's not what dizziness is. It's just, I, I don't know how else to describe this. Uh, um. Okay, okay, um, back to where I was. Right, this... You know, Smog's the name of the dragon from The Hobbit. But yeah, it's like the Dark Souls twin boss things. Low four-star pair of sprites, two flash tone characters I took you input. One was massive. The giant one was thrusting into the... Oh, God. I, I watched in disgust as the big creature stepped away from the small one, leaving it a pile of gore. I laughed and ran away. I finally had enough. I turned the machine off angrily. It was too much for me. It went beyond the realm of video game and into pure tastelessness. I flicked the light switch and went to the house. I needed to calm down a bit. My adrenaline was pumping. I felt like a little kid saying something completely forgetting. forbidden. It was probably how I felt when I actually had been a kid playing the garbage game. After having a drink, I got online and started doing a search. I tried maybe three dozen permutations of search edit terms. Anything I could to think of describe the game or the cover art. I wanted to find out what it was called once and for all, but nothing came up. I'd found stuff this way before, but no matter how many details I gave up or came up with, nothing matched. I would get Castlevania or games like that, articles about games banned for violence and sex, but nothing similar to what I just played. It was like the game didn't exist. That got me thinking that I had something special in my hands. Or maybe it was greed, but this game is one of a kind. Some ultra rare cartridge that next no one knew about? I can make some decent money to help pay for all my mom's expenses. I saw a picture of us together on her mantle and smiled at it. I never realized how odd it seemed that the corner of the picture looked like it was missing someone. Huh. An hour passed, maybe, and I went back to the shed to retrieve the game. I stepped inside and put the lights on, and the TV came on instantly. Weirdly enough, the NES did too, without me touching anything. The game booted to the start screen. I stepped over, turned the machine off, but before I could touch the controller, there was the same ominous beep. I went pressing the start button. And the game began. I thought maybe it was playing a demo, like how a lot of those games used to do. The problem with that theory is that the character on screen wasn't moving. He just stood there in his yellow shirt and blue pants where I had left him. Curiosity forced my hand to pick up the controller. As I expected, this level got even worse. The torture became sexual in nature, the sprites in the background forcing themselves and others in mass of pixelated flesh. The enemies appeared to be nude, women bound in bondage gear. Their limbs twisted so that all they could do was walk toward me and make anguished groaning noises beneath their masks. About halfway through the level, I was given a whip and used it to attack the bondage women. But it had the opposite effect than what I expected. The enemies squirmed and writhed when they were attacked with the whip. Then they just kept coming even though the sprites reddened with blood. I jumped and dodged the rest while trying to ignore what I saw in the background, just focusing on reaching the end. A boss awaited me. The same big man from the beginning of the level. He was fast and constantly laughing every time he charged. My character. He would lash out with a whip occasionally just to throw me off. I dodged, but no weapons ever appeared, even after a minute of this. The more I stared, the more I noticed my character. It was just how un, how re unremarkable he was for a video game character. Brown hair, yellow t-shirt, blue pants. I looked down. It was exactly what I was wearing. In my distraction, I got rammed by the boss, but this wasn't a normal count. Normally my character would flash, bounce back, and then be controllable, but this time, when he touched me, the boss grabbed me, pushed me over. I lunged forward and turned off the console. Just in time to avoid the image on screen. 
I breathed a sigh of relief, utterly traumatized. Then the game came back on. I had been staring at a black screen, and now my character was standing there like nothing happened. Being laughed at. And the boss music was coming through the TV's tiny speakers. I leaned forward and turned off the TV. The button clicked beneath my finger, and the picture faded away. I couldn't believe my eyes, but the TV turned back on too. It had to be something up with the wiring, I told myself. There was no other explanation. This time, I had a weapon in my hands. I noticed that my health bar had a, a sliver left. Acting quickly, I pounded the B button, throwing daggers at the boss until he died. It was over and the game moved on to the next level. But I had enough. I hit the power button on the console, but the light remained on no matter how many times I pressed it. I did the same to the TV, but it wouldn't turn off. I tried unplugging them both, but they stayed on. By this point, I was breathing heavy and completely freaked out. I pulled out the AV cables out of the TV, hoping that would stop it. Certainly, there was no way for the console to play its image on TV. There's no cable connected. No such logic there. I got up and switched off the power to the shed. The lights turned off, and for a moment, I felt a rush of relief. But I saw the glow of the screen out of the corner of my eye and knew it was still on. Angry now, I popped open the lid and pressed open the car down the cartridge, fully willing just to rip the thing out, but the mechanism wouldn't release. It was completely stuck. <coughs> that was fine. I could just leave it on and let it sit. I didn't have to play, except my character started moving again, even though I wasn't touching anything. I watched him travel through a short dungeon corridor, expecting horrible things. Surprisingly, my character reached the end, where a bright light was shining. He stepped through and was back outside. Maybe it was a stupid idea, but I picked up the controller. I wanted to see what was coming next. It looked like the start of the game, but I assumed it was a new area. I wouldn't walk far before I approached a house. Not a medieval house, but just an average, modern, suburban home. I grew up in a house like this. A house like my mom's, in fact. In fact, I was at that house right now. I walked to the door and went inside. It wasn't just like my mom's house. It was her house. The walls were painted the same. The furniture was the same. I swear there was a picture on the mantel that even looked like the two of us together. There were no enemies. As I explored the living room, I noticed toys scattered on the floor. Trucks and blocks. The TV was on, playing fuzzy penguins. The toys moved as I walked through them, knocking them out of the way as I approached TV. The dark shadow on the wall behind it twisted and moved until it turned the shape of a dark figure with curved horns and sharp claws. The shape skittered along the wall and then jumped out toward me, crushing the toys in the ground. I ran, fearing for my life. It was artificial, but I felt like I was in real danger. The screen changed and I entered the bedroom. It was a child's bedroom. Walls prepared paper with dinosaurs. More toys scattered across the ground. One toy in particular stood out a teddy bear with its head ripped off. I looked over my shoulder at the open cardboard box of stuffed animals I had sorted through earlier that evening. My ripped apart bear sat at the edge, barely in view. I shook and looked back at the TV. I was approached, as I approached the virtual bear, the toy lifted off the ground, the body first, and then the head, and the head twirled around in the air for a moment, and then reattached itself. A moment later, the bear grew in size, or maybe I shrank. The shadow of the creature's claws burst out of its hands, horns ripping through the top of its head, it chased me back the way I'd come. The screen transitioned not to the living room this time, but to a hallway. I found myself walking toward an open doorway. Outside, a female sprite was crouched down, crying, her face in her hands. I thought that was odd after everything else I had seen. In fact, the whole thing didn't make sense. But at the time, I was really thinking I would just brace myself the entire end of the room. It was a bedroom, dark and save, for a bolt of lightning coming out from the outside window. The flash of lightning illuminated the shadow figure, sitting sullenly on the bed. The room returned to darkness, and then an ow, 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 ow. And then a bolt filled with lasting light. This time, the shadow took the shape of a man, completely normal looking. He looked up at my character, who was looking more and more like me by the second. Even composed of simple pictures, I could tell the boss was glaring at me. He threw down a glass bottle, which broke, and then stood. Is that a Castlevania reference? I tr it's like, what is a man? Psh, wine glass breaking sound. Worthless pile of secrets. And yeah, it's a castle bait reference. <clears throat> I tried to move, but my stripe was frozen in place, just like I was. So I watched the boss approach. It was definitely smaller than before, and shrinking still, becoming no taller than a child. I watched as the boss removed a belt from his pants 
and held it tightly in his fist like a whip. He approached me, appearing to reach for the front of his pants. I wasn't sure if it was to hold them up or pull them down. O okay. Says, um, still frozen, unable to think, and unable to breathe. I watched in horror as the boss grabbed me, and the screen faded to black. A tear ran down my cheek as I listened to the sound effects playing in the background and the crack of a belt and a child crying. The darkness faded and I realized I had control again. The boss was sitting on the bed facing away from me. I had a knife in my hand. I took a step forward, clenched my teeth, and pressed the B button as hard as I could. Relishing it as the knife flew into the boss's back and killed him one hit, he fell on the ground, blood spilling across the floor. The screen faded to black and the credits began to roll. Within moments, the background changed to the cemetery from the beginning of the game. Someone was digging. It was the crying woman, and she was shoveling dirt out of an unmarked grave as the boss lay dead beside it. Above them, the crooked tree loomed ominously, a crew nestled in it. I tried to make sense of the words on the screen, but the names were garbled nonsense. I didn't care about solving the mystery anymore. My trembling hand reached the power button of the console. This time, the thing turned off and stayed off. I pulled the cartridge out as quickly as I could, putting it on the sleeve and shoving it away in the nearest box I could find. I packed the NES with my other games and left the shed in the box in my hands. I couldn't get away from that shed fast enough. As I stepped outside, walking toward the house and the light from the back porch, I stopped by an old, spindly oak tree, dead and missing all of its leaves. I stared at the ground by the base, watching and waiting as if I was expecting something to happen. I closed my eyes, my whole body shivering, and then ran to the house. I still never learned the name of the game. I stopped looking after that night. I never opened the box again, just donated the whole thing. Playing that game reminded me that there were some memories better left buried. Okay. I can... I can uh, hypothesize what was pretty much pretty obviously, you know, put out there as to what occurred by that ending scene. But I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs>